Luke chapter 10. And let's just read this. Uh, let's read this story and then let's let's put ourselves in the story. Would that be OK? Can we put ourselves into the story? Especially, ladies, I think you're going to identify this morning. Now it came to pass, verse 38, as they went, that he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into whose house? You answer. Her house. Her house. That's important. Now think about this, ladies. Okay, I've been married. Uh, it'll be five years on the 28th of this month. That's an important thing for me to remember. Um, <clears throat> It's very, very uh, delicate time when a woman is entertaining company. Mm -hmm. Uh, As a matter of fact, uh, we are uh, entertaining company today. And Karen started her preparation uh, days in advance to prepare for this day, this Saturday, to entertain company. And so it means a thorough cleaning. Uh, And ladies, you know how to clean. We don't. Men don't know how to clean. Ladies have the the amazing ability to get down and clean baseboards and get in corners and get cobwebs. and, and, uh, And not only that, if you were cooking a meal, there's a preparation that comes into cooking a meal. Now, let's move forward here before I get away from Scripture. Verse 39, and she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Verse 40, but Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, now I don't know, but in my mind, I just see Martha as one of those ladies in the inner city of Cincinnati. And I can kind of see her with her hand on her hip and kind of wagging her head there. I don't know why. Um, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. And so I, I, I just want to step into this situation and this scene just for a second and, and just kind of put ourselves into the story before we jump on Martha's back, because I think Martha is so, so parallel to the church of 2015. Now, you understand the stress and the overall concern that Martha had for things being just right. I mean, she was a woman, so she wanted to be just right, but she wasn't entertaining just any company. She was in entertaining the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. No pressure, right? I mean, Jesus, normally when we have people over the house, we stuff everything into the closet and uh, we hide it where we can. How can you go, how are you going to hide something from Jesus? You know, th- that don't work. And so can you imagine the extent and, and the, the effort that went into making this meal, this dining experience with Jesus the best it ever was. Now, I don't know what they, what they had to eat. I know culturally probably we could talk about what they had to eat. But let's just use our imagination. The pastor is from down south. I believe the, Brother Malcolm, he's from down south. So if we could just use our imagination. This is southern Judea we're talking about. So let's just say that you with me. Let's just say that Martha put on a Southern Judea comfort food meal. And so can you imagine as Jesus walks into uh, the the house and and Martha welcomes him, no doubt, and she offers her to clean his feet and his shoes and to take the the shoes off and all that it was customary for that culture. And he comes in, and I can see the disciples kind of following behind. The disciples always following behind Jesus trying to get some free food. It's kind of like the assistant pastor pastors in the Baptist church, right? You know, you know what I'm talking about, Pastor Dave. And, uh, and so here comes all the disciples coming in. They're sitting down and just, they're just hanging with Jesus. Anything where Jesus gets to go, anything Jesus gets to eat, they get to eat. They just love life. And, and so they all just sit down. I can just see Martha saying, now, fellas, welcome to my home. Make yourself comfortable. Make yourself at home. But let me tell you, uh, your, your desire is my will. You just sit down. Don't move a muscle. And I'm going to serve you the w- wonderful meal I've prepared. Now, I can imagine if this was southern Judea, she went back into her kitchen. She had one of these baskets, and she had a towel over top of the basket. Somebody help me now. And she removed the, oh, yeah, you already with me. Holy Spirit of God. Somebody say, hey, she removed that towel, and then the steam came off, off those, we call them cat head biscuits, right? Put those right in the middle. Somebody say amen. Put those right in the middle of that table there. And if she was really spiritual, if she was really in tune, she'd have a, she'd have a, a, she'd have a jar of honey to put right next to that. 
Or if she was really, really in tune, she'd have apple butter that she put right there. Somebody say amen to that. She puts them. And so they start passing those biscuits around. Somebody, I, I wonder, it, did they have the conversation we have? I don't know. Did somebody say, who's going to pray? Jesus, you're going to pray? Uh, I don't I, Maybe they just took it for granted, right? And, and so they broke the bread and they prayed. And, and so can you imagine now everybody's tearing into those, those biscuits? And then Martha goes back into her kitchen and she gets one of those big old, you know, I don't even understand how big. And she's just a little lady and she's got one of these big old pots that's about yay deep and about this big around. And she comes out and, 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 and she gets her big ladle and she dips down there. And there is the, the best chicken and dumplings. Is lunch after this? Okay. Chicken and dumplings and just gets a big old scoop and it plop right on your. And then, you know, if she had chicken and dump, she had to have mashed potatoes and, and green beans. And I'm not talking about healthy green beans. You know what I'm saying? And you put some unhealthy stuff. Now, they were Jewish. They wouldn't have had swine. But uh, thank God God got that right for us. Right? Amen. Thank God we're not under the law. But. Boy, and so just imagine the, the clinging and the clanking and the, and the conversation, all that's happening now. These guys are tearing into this meal here, and Martha's going back and forth, and, and the dishes are starting to pile up because guys are starting to get finished with their food, and she's kind of looking around the corner, and she doesn't like that the dishes are getting piled up, and so she's looking for her help. And, but before the meal was over, I mean, if Jesus is in the house. You know she got some dessert, Right? <laughs> And so she went back and she got one of those little, those, can, those glass, I don't know what you call it there, those glass things there. She pulled that there and put it on the middle of the table. And there was the finest peach cobbler you ever had. <laughs> oh, I know how to eat. Look at me. <laughs> the finest peach cobbler. Brother Malcolm, if, this was Southern Judea, right? So she, she, went to the, she went to the ice box and she pulled out some bluebell ice cream or maybe some Briars vanilla ice cream and put that on top. And boy, all those, they love being at Martha's house. But things need to be clear now. And maybe the Lord wants some coffee. And, and Martha's looking and her help is nowhere to be found. Finally, she gets a glimpse and she sees her sister. Now, this is how she perceives. By the way, perception is your reality. It's not reality, it's your reality. So she looks around the corner and perceives and sees her sister in her mind doing nothing. Sitting on her behind, that's what she thought she was doing. And she looked around the corner, I cannot believe I've been up. I've been up since early this morning getting these biscuits ready. I've been up cleaning and here my own sister can't even help. So she comes around the corner and Jesus, will you tell this sister of mine to help me? She was waiting for Jesus to vindicate her actions. There's a whole lot of people in church today. They show up on Sunday morning praying God would vindicate how they've been living. But I think Jesus has a word that she wasn't expecting. Verse number 41. And Jesus answered and said unto her, notice, Martha, Martha. Now, you know you're in trouble when Jesus calls your name twice. Martha, Martha, almost like, what am I going to do with you? Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about how many things? The church in 2015. You are careful and troubled about many things. And maybe in that moment, she was still kind of grinning and waiting for Jesus to vindicate. See, he he appreciates me. He notices all the trouble I've gone to. He notices how careful I've been. He he's getting ready to vindicate me. You are careful and troubled about many things, but one thing. Somebody say one thing. One thing. One thing is needful. And Mary, oh what a dagger to the heart. And Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Here in this moment where Martha is looking for the affirmation of Jesus, Jesus speaks a word and says, you are so busy and concerned about so many things, but there's only one thing that is needful. And it's not what you've been doing, Martha. It's what Mary's been doing. And I'm not calling her away from what she's doing. I want you to notice here the balance of a believer. 
I want you to know that a balanced believer, number one, is in their proper place. A balanced believer is in their proper place. Notice here, verse number 39. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat where? At Jesus' feet. Number one, the sub point here, she was in his presence. She was in his presence. Now, what was the contrary? What is the comparison? What was Martha doing? Well, the Bible says, look what it says there, verse 40. But, notice there, the compare and contrast. Anytime you see that word, but, okay, it's comparing, it's contrasting. But Martha was what? Cumbered. I looked that, that word up. It says to draw around, to draw away, to distract, to be driven about mentally, to be distracted, to be overoccupied about a thing. See the comparison? Mary is in the presence of her Savior, and Martha is distracted. She's overoccupied. Notice this here, verse number 39. The balance of a believer. She's in her proper place because she's in his presence. Now notice this. Which also sat at Jesus' feet, and then what? And heard his word. Not only was she in his presence, but she was hearing his precepts. You understand how many times Pastor Tony have people come into church and they sit down on the front row. Maybe they even get a notepad out and they look really good. I mean, they're dressed nice and they know the part. They know all the right words to say. They got their notebook out and the preacher starts preaching. They go, I wonder how many ceiling tiles is in this room. here. Is Is that a new little thing they got up there? And you think because you caught 70% of the sermon that maybe you have done a service to God. But I believe that the book of James says that if you are a hearer of the word and not a doer of the word, you're deceiving yourself. And so notice that she's, she's in his presence. She's listening to his precepts. But this is the most important. She gave him the preeminence. Mary said the most important thing for me to do, the one needful thing for me to do right now is to be in the presence of Jesus. Now, can I ask you the question? What was Martha doing? Was it a bad thing? No, not a bad thing at all. But was it the best thing? See, the question this morning is not, is my life filled with bad things because I I happen to believe people who show up on Saturday morning to come to church, right? You don't have a whole lot of bad things in your life. But the question this morning is not whether they're bad things, but am I giving my life to the best thing? The best thing. Mary said, here's what Mary said. I don't happen to believe Mary was a lazy person. Here's what Mary said in my mind. You ready? I'll wait till Jesus leaves to do the dishes. You with me? So a balanced believer, number one, are in their proper place. Now, this is what's so amazing about this story is the narrative of Mary and Martha doesn't end in Luke chapter 10. And we begin to learn some things as we do a character study of these ladies. We'll learn the byproduct of living an unbalanced life. Now look what happens if we'll turn to John chapter 11. John 11. And those of you scripture memory, kings and queens, Bible drill, sword drill queens, you're going to know exactly what story I'm talking about when I say John chapter 11. Can I tell you, the greatest trials and tests of life, true, they prove your truest character. You're going to learn whether or not you can, if you can take it when you are tested, when you are going to, if you are a man and, and you're having a, 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 a health procedure and you want to find out uh, how good your heart is, you're going to, they're going to give you a stress test. You see, because the only way to properly measure the health of your heart is to put it under stress. So they'll put a big fat guy like me up on a treadmill and see see how long I can go and see how much I sweat and see how much my blood pressure and see how much bacon grease comes from my head. And Because you cannot properly test somebody unless you put them under stress. 
And so here we find out the balanced believer and who they are. And we find out the byproduct of an unbalanced believer when a temptation, with a trial, with, with a problem comes. Now, I don't have time to read the whole chapter, but I'm going to take it from granted that if you haven't read it, you will read it today. Or if you do know it, I won't in, in challenge your intelligence. But we know verse number one now, a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. We are all in agreement that we're talking about the same ladies we were just talking about. Look at verse um, number four and five. Jesus heard that uh, when Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the son of God might be glorified thereby. This is not the message. But can I tell you, Jesus said that the death of Lazarus was for the glory of God. If you are going through a trial, if you're going through a sickness. If God has chosen to give you cancer it's for the glory of God, God wants to show up in your life. God wants to show out his glory and his preeminence. Someone said this when you're down to nothing he may just be up to something Amen. I was supposed to be teaching but I'll go ahead and preach a little bit too. Preach it, teach it, whatever you want. Yeah, right and he says for the glory of God verse number five notice this oh what a word pastor Tony this is a word for me verse number five now Jesus loved Martha oh all oh, the grace all oh, the grace even us in our fallen state, even us in our imperfection. This morning, I know there's people already convicted because you're a Martha and I'm right there with you because I'm a Martha and I get convicted. But then I read verse number five and right in the middle of my dysfunction, God still loves me. Even though while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Martha loved, Jesus loved Martha. Notice, and her sister and Lazarus, I want to say quickly, I would be remiss if I didn't say that Jesus loves us in a way that we can't even love ourselves. Listen, don't don't curse God in your moment of temptation. Don't curse God in your moment of tribulation. Jesus loves Lazarus just as much as you love him. Don't think that God is is distant. Don't think that God is, is forgetful. No, Jesus loved Martha. He loved Mary and he loved Lazarus. Now, let me move along here. We know the story. Lazarus dies. And um, verse number 14, look what Jesus says. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Take note of that if you're one of those note takers. Verse 14, Jesus says to his disciples, Lazarus is dead. Now let's move forward. Verse number um, 20. Notice, now I'm getting ready to show you the byproduct of an unbalanced life. Verse 20. Then Martha, notice this word. As soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But notice this. Now, remember every time I said you see the word but? That's a compare and contrast. Look what it says there. But what? Mary sat still in the house. You see that there? I want to say, number one, a balanced believer is patient. A balanced believer is patient. Jesus is on his way. Mary, I'm just going to sit right here. Jesus is on the way. Martha, I'm getting, I'm going to give him peace of my mind. Right? Let's move forward. If you don't believe me, verse 21. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, notice this, thy brother shall rise again. Now stop. What did Jesus promise? He promised a resurrection. He promised the miraculous. He promised the supernatural. Now somebody who was in tune, somebody who was balanced, someone who was a true worshiper would have said, time out, Jesus. What exactly do you mean by that? But no, Martha goes on to give Jesus a sermon. Verse 24. You ever got a sermon before, Pastor Tony? Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Not only was it a sermon, it was a prophetic sermon. She's trying to teach Jesus prophecy. (laughs) Notice Jesus' response. Maybe I'm reading this into her, but I I think it's right there. Notice Jesus' response. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Notice what he says. 
He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Now, Jesus just dropped a big old theological bomb right on Martha's head. You could be dead, but you will live again. If you're alive and you're believing, you'll never die. Do you believe this? Yeah. Now, the, the, the balanced, in tune, worshipful Christian would have sat down and said, Now, Jesus, would you, would you explain that to me? Because it sounds like you said, If I'm alive and I believe, then I will never die. That sounds like that's too good to be true. Can you explain that to me? What do you think Martha did? Look what happens. She said unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. Here's the key verse, verse 28. And when she had so said, she went her way. And when she had so said, so meaning, as soon as she got her words out of her mouth, she then turned around and went her way. What I am trying to say to you is an imbalanced person always tries to get the last word. Isn't that what the Bible says? When she has so said, she went her way. Got the last word with God. I wonder how many people right now this morning, you're trying to get the, right, the last word with God. God, you don't understand my finances. I'm going to run it the way I want to run. I get the last word for my finances. God, you don't understand my marriage. I get the last word in my marriage. God, you don't understand the problems I'm having at my job or with my kids or at this church. I get the last word, God. You may not be saying it with your lips, but you're saying it with your life. When she has so said, she went her way. Now notice this. She went her way and called Mary her sister secretly saying, the master has come and calleth for thee. Notice this, verse 29. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto him. What a compare contrast. Martha hears Jesus is on his way and she takes off and meets him right in the middle. She gets the last word and she turns around and leaves him right there and goes and tells Mary, Mary, now, Mary's been sitting still. She knew Jesus was on the way, but she's been sitting still in the house. And she says, Mary, Jesus is calling for you. At that moment, Mary jumps up and as quick as she can, she goes to Jesus. See, a balanced person understands the prompting of God. I'm going to sit myself right here. I'm going to be still and know he is God. But when he calls, I'm a going. See that there? Now, notice this. All oh, this is such a good word. Somebody needs this this morning. Look what the Bible says. Verse 30. Now Jesus was not yet coming to town, but was in that place where Martha met him. That means Martha left him standing right there. I, I, I'm going to move forward. The Jews are weeping, and they think Mary's going to go weep. Verse 32. Here it is. Oh, what a word. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down where? Isn't that where we first met Mary? Balanced believers are patient. Number two, balanced believers have a pattern about their life. What I'm saying is they're consistent. They're consistent. How many people, and when I point a finger at you, there's three fingers pointing back at me. How many people, this kind of looks like your Christian life. Oh, praise God. Oh, y'all pray for me. <laughs> God is so good. I'm too blessed to be stressed. Oh, Lord, I don't know how I'm going to get through this one. I, I don't think Mary had a Christian life that was a roller coaster. I think she had a Sunday afternoon drive Christianity. There was a pattern. There was a consistency. How many people you've known somebody like that? They just seem consistent. Is that an a, a, a attribute that's desirable? 
Aren't those people just, there's some, and it, and it overflows, it bleeds into every area of their life. Their finances, it seems like they got their stuff together, and, 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 and their, their kids seem to, I don't know, their kids seem to respect them in a way that my kids don't respect me. It just seems like everything, there's consistency to their life when they have a pattern. Now notice, what was the, what was the permanency to that power, that pattern? It was the presence of Jesus, the presence of Jesus. Now, notice this. Oh, what a word. I know. I know. It's not me. I'm not saying that because it's me. I'm saying it because it's the Bible. Look, look what the Bible says. Notice it word for word. Notice what the Bible says. And when uh, uh, let's let's see here. Verse 32. When when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. Was that not reprobatum the same thing that Martha said? But notice the different reaction of Jesus. Look what happens. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, there's a difference. And the Jews also weeping which came with her. He groaned in the spirit and was troubled and said, where have ye laid him? Notice Martha. Let's give it the whole story. She hears Jesus is coming. She takes off running. Mary sits still. She gives Jesus a piece of her mind, leaves him standing and gets the last word. Right. Says, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Jesus responds to give her a sermon, a theological lecture. She goes, calls Mary. Mary, as soon as she hears the word of Jesus, that's when she takes off. She gets there in the presence at his feet, weeping and says the same thing, but from a different heart. Lord, if you'd have been here, he wouldn't have died. Does Jesus give Mary a sermon? Does he give her a lecture? Does he sit down and counsel her? No. What does he do? Mm. Where's he at? Mm. I'm about to do something. That's what he was saying. Oh, my friends, can I tell you, not only are balanced people patient and they have a pattern to their life, but they have power with God. They have power with God. You see, an uh, 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 imbalanced person can get the attention of God, but a balanced person can touch the heart of God. Lord, if you, have, if you would have been here, because I believe you're all powerful, because God, you can do anything. If you would have been here, he wouldn't have died. I want to do something for that heart. I want to do something for that life. I want to do something. Is there anybody this morning you want power with God? Like Israel of old, you want God to change your situation. You want God to change your name. You want God to change your circumstance. It doesn't come with giving God a lecture. It doesn't come with getting the last word with God. But it comes with kneeling humbly in his presence and letting tears flow down your cheek and say, God, you can do anything. There's nothing too hard for you so worshipers number two this was the second point i've held it this long worshipers who are balanced have a proper perspective balanced people are in their proper place balanced people have a proper perspective of life and then lastly the story the narrative of mary and martha doesn't end in chapter 11 does it here's probably what Mary is most famous for chapter 12. Look what the Bible says. You, you, it, you just have to catch this. If you don't catch this, then you're not awake. Verse number 12. Oh, what, what, what did I skip? I mean, I, I mean I'm, for time's sake, I'm skipping the resurrection of Lazarus. I mean, I mean just, take it, just, just stay with me just for a second. I mean, so Jesus goes, Jesus goes to the grave, right? And he says, roll away the stone. Guess who interjects? That's it. Lord, don't do that. Don't. He's, been, he's been dead for four days. Don't you realize he, that corpse is rotting and it smells? Now, remember when I said take note of verse number 14? Right? What did I say? Jesus told the disciples expressly, he's dead. Now, what is Martha telling Jesus now? He's dead. Why are you trying to tell something like God don't know it? Are you with me this morning? Why, why, when you come to God, why are you trying to tell stuff to God like he don't know it already? Why are you coming with that type of attitude? Now, God, you know I need to pay this bill. 
Have you ever heard, I don't think this is our type believers, but have you ever heard those people demand and talk to God like that? To, to threaten God and to, and to God, now you better, you better show up right now. You better do this. You better, you said, come, I don't think that's the right perspective. I don't think that's a balanced person, right? Jesus, he's been dead for four days. Are you, are you trying to give Jesus a lesson? Now notice, Jesus I have to read it. I mean, I, I mean, you wouldn't believe me if I um, if I didn't didn't read it here. Look, um, verse thirty nine, verse forty. Jesus said to her, "Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God?" Didn't I tell you? I wonder how many times through the Holy Spirit, God is speaking to our hearts and say, "Didn't I tell you? Didn't I tell you? I you ask and you'll." You'll find, seek and you find, knocking and shall be open unto you. Didn't I tell you that? Didn't I tell you, cast your cares upon me, for I care for you? Didn't I tell you that? Didn't I tell you, come unto me, that all you that are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest? Didn't I tell you? Thank God, God didn't stop the miracle that day because of the interjection of an unbalanced believer. And so, you know the story. Jesus says, roll away the stone, and he prays. And then he cries out in a loud voice, Lazarus! The old time preacher said it's a good thing he called Lazarus by name or there would have been a whole bunch of dead people walking that day. (laughs) That voice, that voice pierced the silence, Lazarus! That, That voice, it pierced the darkness, Lazarus! That voice pierced even into death itself. And can I tell you, my friends, the voice of Jesus is still powerful today. The voice of Jesus can pierce through your darkest situation. The voice of Jesus can can pierce through even a, a situation of death in your life. He can resurrect your marriage. He can resurrect your faith. He can resurrect your wayward child. If you'll just trust him, Lazarus, come forth. And then here comes Lazarus on the hip. They don't <laughs> But it all happened because he didn't let an unbalanced person throw him off his game. Hmm. Now, that was what I missed. Let's close it up because it's time to eat. (laughs) John chapter 12. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany. Does that sound like a familiar village? Where Lazarus was, which had been. I do not know English very well, but I know those are all past tense verbs, and I like them. Which was, which had been. Been. I'm glad I am a which was, which had been lost man. I'm glad I am a which was, had been sinner. I'm glad I was a which was, had been child of darkness. But now I am a child of God. I thank God for those past tense verbs. Amen. Who, whom he raised from the dead. Verse 2. Notice this. Oh, you, if you missed this, you, you, I don't understand. There they made him a what? That sound familiar? Sound like Luke chapter 10? Now, look at your Bible. And Martha sat at Jesus' feet. No, that's surely. After all that, after he told her expressly, Mary's doing the good thing. After she gave him a piece of his mind and he taught her. And then even when she tried to interject him doing the supernatural, he sat her. You mean even with all that, she's not at his feet? No. What does the Bible say? You know it. And Martha served. Isn't that how we found Martha in the first place? Here's the last thing. Number one was worshipers are in their, or balanced believers are in their proper place. Number two, balanced believers have the proper perspective. And then number three, balanced believers have proper priorities. Martha served. Notice this, but. Remember I said notice that whenever you see the word but? There's a compare and contrast. But Lazarus 
was one of them that sat at the table with him. So get this picture here. Jesus is at the table and sitting right next to Jesus is who? Lazarus. Now, remember I said, let's put ourselves in a story. Put yourself in that story. And that is your Lord and your Savior who just resurrected your four day dead brother. Where would you be? I happen to believe I'd be camped up right in between Jesus and Lazarus. Hey, could you scooch over there, Lazarus? I want to sit right next to you and I want to sit right next to Jesus. Lazarus, what was it like? Did you see the great white light that everybody talks about? I mean, what 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 did Jacob look like? Right. I mean, you would have been. Oh, and Lazarus, thank God. I was. Oh, my heart was so broken. But you're alive. And then in that moment, I'd have turned over. and said, oh, Jesus. What do I even say, Jesus? You resurrected my dead brother. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, whatever it is, you take my life. I I can never repay you. Isn't that what you would do? That's what I hope I would do. But Mary served. Martha, but Martha served. Okay. But what was Mary doing? Ah, here it is. Verse 3. I'm closing up, I promise. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly. One gospel writer says precious. And wiped his feet, her, wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Let me tell you, balanced believers have the proper priority. Number one, they understand what is pertinent. They understand what's important. When Jesus and your once dead brother is at the table, the dishes can wait. She understand what was pertinent. She understood what was precious. She takes that thing. It's worth what some would say a year's wages. I don't know what that was for back then, but you put you put your price tag on it. A year's wages. Thirty thousand dollars. Forty thousand dollars. Pastor Dave, hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> A year's wages. She takes that precious, precious savings and she breaks it. She pours it on Jesus and she wipes his feet with her hair and all the smell, the odor. The odor filled the whole room. Now, can I tell you, there are people who don't like your worship. There are people who don't like your balance. There are people who don't like your flow with God. And they even said to Mary, what is she doing? What a waste. Jesus said, leave her alone. Because why? She's wrought a good work unto my what? My burial. See, here's the last thing. Balanced people understand what's pertinent, what's precious, what's precious, and they understand promptness. Because just a few days later, Jesus would be beaten, he'd be ridiculed, he'd be spit upon, he'd be whipped, he'd be nailed to a cross, he'd be crucified, he'd give his life. It was a Sabbath and they were rushing to get him off of the cross. So they rushed him off of the cross and put him into a borrowed tomb. And he laid there on those Sabbath days, the Passover, the feast of the Passover, and then the Saturday Sabbath. And so as soon as they could, some ladies came to anoint that broken body of Jesus. But when they got there, there was an angel. I love it how Mark says it, an angel sitting on the rock. I don't know how he would say it, but if he was from Cincinnati, he'd say, what you doing here for? (laughs) He's not here. He's risen. Come and see the place where he lay. Can I ask you this question simply? Did anybody anoint the body of Jesus on Resurrection Sunday? Mm -mm. As a matter of fact, there was only one person who anointed the body of Jesus. Guess who it was? Mary. You say, Pastor Kirk, how in the world did she know to anoint his body before his death? She'd been in his presence so long. She'd been hearing his precepts so long. She understood his plan. Didn't Jesus say to his disciples expressly, hey, I'm going to be going. I'm going to be delivered to sinful men. I'm going to li-. 
And what did, how did they respond to that? Not on my watch. Not, 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 not while me. No, we will mount up. We will take a fool. We will smoke a fool. That's what Peter said. <laughs> Jesus expressly said it plain as day that he was going to be delivered into the hand of sinful men. He was going to be, he was going to be killed. And even the disciples didn't understand the plan of God. But a balanced, spiritual, worshipful little lady who had been in his presence, who had been listening to what he had to say, who understood the preciousness of who he was and said, if I'm going to do something for him, I better do it for him now. She anointed the body of Jesus. You know, this all hit me like a ton of bricks when I woke up one morning and I realized I was a Martha. And my previous ministry, and it was, it's a great ministry, great ministry. Um, but we just come from that generation that more is better and bigger is better. We come from that, you know, that was great. Now, how can we make it better for next year? That's, that's, the, that's where we come from. Not to say that those things aren't good. Remember, we're not talking about bad things. And so, I, you know, just like every church, you know, staff. I was doing everything I could to help the church. I was leading the choir and, and uh, along with other things. And I had this idea and I came to my pastor and you kind of look like my pastor. It's okay if you play the role of my pastor. I said, pastor, I got this idea for this year's Christmas cantata. I said, pastor, um, people love Christmas lights. Don't people love Christmas lights? People love Christmas lights. And the ones that get the most attention are the ones people put on their house and they synchronize the music to their, Christian, their, their, their Christmas lights. People will they'll line up for miles and miles. I said, so what if, what if, just stay with me, what if we synchronize a Christmas light show to our cantata? Boom. <laughs> and he said, that sounds like a great idea. And then he said, Y'all know my pastor? You do it. Okay, now remember, I come from the Martha-ism. So bigger is better, more is better. So 75,000 lights later. 20-foot Christmas tree later, right? We put ourselves on a Christmas light show. Oh, yeah, it was awesome. For the church, it was hell for my wife. November the 1st until December the 17th, I worked. Literally, I was the first person in the morning at the church, and I was the last person to leave. There were times, I remember, I'd come home late, 11 o'clock at night after working all day. Karen was already in the bed asleep with our little newborn child who was getting ready to have her first Christmas season. And she would already be asleep. I'd lay down. You ever done this before, Martha's? I'd lay down, and I, my mind was just going and going, everything I needed to do for the next day, everything I needed to buy, everything I needed to get ready. And I couldn't turn my mind off. So instead of laying there, not sleeping, I got back up and went back to work. There's every once in a while, I'll start going through our, our albums. And I'll say, I don't remember that. And Karen will say, Christmas lights. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. Christmas lights was awesome. But my baby's first Christmas would have been better. But this is what made it worse. This is when God woke me up one day and slapped me upside the head like he did Martha. Didn't I tell you? I get a phone call from my mom right in the middle of this. And I call my mom the queen of Christmas because she loves Christmas. So she was the number one rooter for the Christmas lights. (laughs) But I get a phone call from mom. Kurt, have you talked to your dad recently? I've been busy with the lights, mom. Did you remember he, he went in for a doctor's appointment? been working and then she said this I'll never forget it you need to call your dad and I'm a pastor I know what that means long story short dad had a spot of cancer above his kidney 
thank the Lord, they had a proper procedure. And this has been years ago, and it, it is, it's not growing. It's gone. Thank God, right? But I have prayed with hundreds of people at the hospital. But I did not pray with my own daddy. Not because I was involved in bad things. But because I didn't tune in to the best thing. I was out of balance. You know what God said? Jesus said in John 4. The father seeketh such to worship him. God is playing hide and go seek. And he's looking for some balanced people. He's looking for some worshipers. He's looking for some people who will prioritize their life. Some people who will put him in their life and not just the outskirt, not the what you were talking about, the orbiting. You know, there was somebody who used to, they had the theory that the earth was the center of the universe. Did you know that? Some people still believe it, that the earth is the center of the universe. And then some other scientists came along and said, no, 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 no. The sun is the center of our solar system. And so my question as I close is this. What's your theory? Does everything revolve around your world or does everything revolve around the sun?